Okay, so chapter five, I, I, I tend to, well, let me, I'll put it to you this way. There are really two parts to chapter five, and they're both interesting in their own right. There are four modules. The first two modules, really the first three modules, have to do with some level of consciousness from the standpoint of awareness. Am I alert or not alert? So here's how I want to start. When we say states of consciousness, which is the title for Unit 5, we're going to divide consciousness into three different categories. Okay? There are various levels of consciousness inside of those categories, but let's start. We're going to talk a lot about homeostasis today. It's going to be similar to the Rockstar Manifesto. It won't be so much about how do you control your chemistry, but it's going to be about chemistry and circadian rhythms and homeostasis. So let's start with this idea of consciousness. If there are three sort of levels of consciousness. You can be conscious in the sense that you are awake, alert, interacting with your environment from a sensory and perceptual way. You are conscious as opposed to unconscious. The second level would be being unconscious. That could be sleep or it could be you got knocked unconscious or it could be that you're in a coma. It could be that you're a bear and you're hibernating, but that's unconscious from the standpoint of not interacting with the physical world around you. Sensory, perceptually, you are unaware of what's going on around you. So we have conscious, we have unconscious, and then we have some type, I'm gonna use the phrase altered state, right? I don't wanna say intoxicated because you can be in like a hypno hyp hypnotic state, you could be in, a, in an altered state because you were sleep deprived, you could be, there are various ways that you could alter the consciousness of your mind, maybe through meditation or something that, like that without actually intoxicating the mind with a chemical. So next week, we'll get into that. Today, we're going to look at module 23. Tomorrow, we'll look at module 24. And then next week, we're going to go back to the altered state. So we'll talk about things like hypnosis. We'll talk about like post-hypnotic suggestions. We'll talk about meditation. And then we'll get into psychoactive drugs. So just to give you a preview, because it does kind of tie into what we're talking about today. When we say psychoactive, a lot of people see that and they think psychotic. Psychotic drugs, like hallucinogenic drugs. That's certainly a type of psychoactive drug, but that, that's not what we're referring to. Psychoactive in a literal sense. Any foreign substance that activates the mind, right? So, so to kind of just set that up and leave it on a ledge, let's talk statistics. Of all the known substances that you can ingest, breathe in, drink, eat, smoke, snort, somehow get into your bloodstream, and it doesn't matter if they're viral, bacterial, chemical, mineral, of all the known substances, 96% of them will not affect your brain, right? 96% of, of the known substances that can somehow enter your bloodstream will not activate the mind. So there's that small 4% of psychoactive substances. And most of them you know, it's things like caffeine or it's things like um, pain medication, whether it's like acetaminophen, um, would be psychoactive. Ibuprofen is not psychoactive. It does not activate the mind. Um, it would be caffeine, of course. It would be morphine derivatives like opiums, opiates, and things like that. Barbiturates and stimulants and, you know, things like that. Depressants. And, of course, viruses and things like that. So we're going to kind of put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that next week. But that would be a chemically altered state. But you can also alter the mind through hypnosis and through sleep deprivation or through some kind of like trance or some dissociative fugue state. Um, I don't know, some delusional or a hallucination or something like that. So we're gonna say the three states of consciousness that you could be in, one of the three at any given time would be conscious, unconscious, or altered. So in, in this module, module 23, we're gonna focus on sleep, sleep cycles, what's happening that we see on brainwave cycles, what are alpha waves versus delta waves, what do we know about sleep, what are the, some of the misconceptions about sleep, sleep cycles, and dreams. And then when we get to unit 24, we're going to talk more about dreams, and that'll be things like, you know, Freudian ideas of latent and manifest content in dreams, that's the timeline and the story of your dreams. We'll talk about the biological purpose for dream. We'll talk about the neurological theories behind dreams. We'll talk about the psychological theories behind dreams. We'll get into those things tomorrow. Lucid dreams and you know all the things that people want to know about sleep disorders, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, and things like that. So today, 
let's look at the patterns of homeostasis as this is a good launching point. All right, I want to skip the first unit and go to unit 23 because it's a good way to set everything up. In my opinion, this should be the first unit in the chapter. So we're going to talk a lot today about homeostasis and chemical balance. And, and one of the key kind of terms I'm going to use is rhythm, right, rhythmic. It's cyclical, right? So you have a day-to-day -day cycle, a biological cycle, which is your circadian rhythm. You have sleep cycles within that circadian rhythm. You have metabolic cycles, right? We'll get into another chapter. We'll talk about like your resting metabolic rate, your basal metabolic rate. These are like how many calories are you burning just sitting in a chair, right? So metabolism is part of it. You know, your breakdown of sugar is part of it. Your conscious awareness is part of it. The regulation of your body temperature is part of it. These are all the limbic mammal things, autonomic chemical bloodstream things that are hormonal and chemical, right? So the good news is we get to do some review here. You have three major regions to the brain, not lobes or hemispheres, but the regions of your brain. You have the reptile brain, right? And that's the thing that every brained animal shares. That's the way that you regulate your heartbeat. That's the medulla and how you breathe. That you have the cerebellum, which is the ability to coordinate body movements. Uh, the ability to take visual data and coordinate it with your body movements, it's balance. You have the reticular formation, which is going to alert you or wake you up from an unconscious state. And you have things like the visual cortex of the brain, right? You have the thalamus, you have all of these brainstem reptilian tasks. So let's call that life maintenance. If the brainstem is li life maintenance, we're going to focus on the limbic system today. The limbic system is the most fun, right? Because it's autonomic as opposed to somatic. So you have a somatic system of nerves and that controls, that's like kinesthetic um, nerve cells. It's, it is um, you know, knowing where your feet are, your hands, your fingers. It, is, uh, it has to do with you know, skeletal structures, muscular movement, uh, pain messages from nociceptors in your joints, in your hands, arms and legs, tissue damage. So like somatic, soma, meaning the body. This is autonomic. This is soft tissue, this is endocrine organs, this is glands. These are the things that regulate the chemicals in your body. That's what we're gonna talk about today. All of this is driven by the hypothalamus. Your homeostatic state as a mammal is a constant pursuit for chemical balance. So you do have to understand homeostasis in order to understand sleep cycles and sleep rhythms and REM cycles because that all matters, it's all part of it. And it really is much deeper than that, right? So when you start looking at the evolutionary, biological, chemical, hormonal repercussions of, of, of our chemistry and our biology, our rate of technology, our rate of invention, our rate of development, our culture, the setup of our society is progressing and evolving at a much faster rate than our brain chemistry. So. Here's why that's significant. We live in a developed nation, maybe the most developed nation, and certainly one of the top two or three. We live in a country that has, by all accounts, the highest standard of living. We live in a country where we do not have to expend our energy finding resources, and that's the problem, right? That's the problem. Because the reality is this. If you lived in a developing country now, or if you lived in our country when it was developing, say 200 years ago, you wouldn't see the same psychological, cognitive, and emotional issues that we struggle with as a society today. You have discussions in your classes and people talk about this on social media. Are people more anxious now? Well, by all accounts, they are. Whether it's because it's diagnosed more, whether it's because you recognize it more, whether it's because the triggers are, are different, by all accounts, people are more anxious now. People suffer from emotional trauma, depression, suicidal ideation. So we've reached the point now where we can remove our psychological problems from our sustenance, from our existence. In other words, why are we depressed? It's not because we don't have access to food. It's not because we don't have access to a sexual partner. It's not because we don't have access to meaningful relationships. No. It's because our homeostatic biology and chemistry is very, very, very much behind the development of our society. 
So most of what our brain chemistry is designed to be used for is no longer necessary. If you live a, a subsistence life, then very literally most of your energy is devoted to finding food. So when you wake up in the morning, there's the quest and stress level of finding your next meal. And that comes with stress, obviously. There's, the, there's some uncertainty of that. So we tend to believe this is a good situation. We live in a land of abundance. We can buy food at restaurants and grocery stores and we can get it wherever we want. So we don't have to stress. Our cortisol is not being released, norepinephrine, with the anticipation of finding and stalking, hunting and killing food. But that comes at a price because we still create and release cortisol. We still create and release norepinephrine. So our stress did not go away. It's just being triggered by something that's not sustenance. So how do we understand anxiety? How do we understand depression? How do we understand all of these things? We are the same biologically as every other mammal creature on the planet and certainly every other human on the planet. But yet our chemical and psychological problems, even if they're the same, are rooted in different sources. And that's good because it helps us really evaluate homeostasis. It helps us evaluate. It also helps us to be empathetic, right? So we don't play this game where like you're a teenager and you're a suburban and you have a, you know, a pretty good existence and so your problems don't matter. That's a dangerous trap. But there's people that believe that, right? There's people that believe, well, you're 16. What do you know? You don't have any real problems. That's not accurate. That's not a good way to evaluate anyone, right? The, what, the, the right question is, from, from a cyclical balance standpoint, from a homeostatic standpoint, what is it that causes you the most stress? And it changes in your stage of life. So imagine how school would be different and like athletic organizations would be different and parenting would be different if that were people's mindset. It's not, let's downplay the anxiety that you're experiencing, young teenager. In other words, essentially making you feel bad for having stress responses. But no, we have to take the angle of like, what is it at this developmental stage of your life in this culture that's causing you the most stress, right? Because then we get into all kinds of psycho psychoactive things. You look at psychological disorders like hyperactivity. How do we treat hyperactivity? Well, it's a dopaminergic system. It's a dopaminergic pathway. So if we want to treat hyperactivity, what do we do? We give people Adderall, we give them Ritalin. That's problematic, right? It can be problematic. What happens when people have anxiety? We give them an SNRI, it's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, like Xanax, right? That could be a problem, right? When people have depression, people suffer from, from, from chronic depression, maybe not suicidal ideation, but they're depressed, we give them an SSRI. It affects the serotonin system. That can be a problem, why? Because of homeostasis. Understanding how addictions happen, understanding how chemical balance happens, understanding how development happens is all a question of homeostasis. And what if it's not even just addiction? What if we look at our emotional systems this way? Because it's not just sleep. Think about it this way. We have positive and negative emotions, right? But it's, we, you already know, this is not positive, good, negative, bad. It's positive in excess, negative in depletion, right? So sadness is a negative emotion. Not because it's problematic, but it's a negative emotion because it's a lack of serotonin. So from a homeostatic standpoint, it's negative because something is going to have to increase the serotonin in your pathways in order to get you back to normal. What about rage? Rage is a positive emotion. Not in the sense that it's a good, beneficial emotion, but it's positive in the sense that you are in oversupply of several chemicals. And that's important to understand because if our approach, like what Freud talks about with displacement, right? So you, you're raging right now, so what do you do? You go punch the side of your car. Well, that's not productive, but it kind of is because you, you effectively it basically spent the energy that has been released and built up. But that's a good example. Rage is an important thing to keep you alive. Why would your ancestors need to experience blind rage? Because something is trying to eat them. Probably something that's stronger than them. So they have to go to this almost supernatural level of access to energy and, 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 and blocking of fear so that they can survive. 
But you may not ever get attacked by an animal that's trying to eat you, but you still have rage. So if we don't understand homeostasis, then we can treat people therapeutically the wrong way, right? How do we treat your anger problems? By telling you to be less angry. If only, if only that worked, right? No, you have this rage energy that's manifesting itself chemically, and it has, for it to be called sublimation, it, we, we have to expend that energy in a positive way. What is anxiety? An overflow of glutamate in the brain. You have a hyperactive mind. It's like a thought migraine, almost literally, right? If you want to cure that anxiety, there's an emotional, no, nah, that's not the right way to look at it. There, there's a cognitive energy that has to be spent. And that might be meditation or it might be some kind of like yoga or relaxation. It might be some kind of therapy. It might be some conversation that you have. But the, the bottom of the, the point is this. You, we have to experience we have to respect our chemistry and understand our circadian homeostatic cycles in order to manipulate our own chemistry, to take control of our life, like the Rockstar Manifesto in day two. So the goal is not how do I make my chemicals stop happening? The goal is how do I manage my chemistry to optimize, right? That's the key to all of this. Why, why understand sleep? Why understand circadian rhythms? Why understand psychological disorders? Why understand substance abuse? Why? why? Because we want to optimize the, our, our potential life, right? So when we talk about this in the Rockstar Manifesto, you, you got three paths. You're, you're intentionally living on purpose, or you're complacent, or you're even being destructive. Well, why does it matter? Because think about this. We, we're going to talk about sleep in just a minute. And the conventional American wisdom says, what is the bottom level of sleep that I can get and still function? And okay, maybe that's valid. But if, if we change our mindset to say, how do I optimize my life in this area? Then it's not the minimum level of sleep that I need to get. It's how do I, throw this room up, how do I optimize my sleep schedule. How do I optimize my mental well-being is what it is, right? Because what if we find out that, the, that a, a huge possible contributing factor to your anxiety is the fact that you have an unhealthy sleep pattern. And it may not be that you don't get enough sleep. It might be that you don't have the kind of quality sleep that you need to have. What if a source of your emotional negativity, like a lack of serotonin, is poor sleep, poor diet? Lack of exercise. Those are things that you can control, right? So homeostasis is important. Emotions are important. And here's the thing. It takes a while to learn this. But we give too much, we give too much uh, freedom to our emotional state, right? When we talked about love in the Rockstar Manifesto, that's the problem with love. I can feel rage. I know it's real. It's like I'm experiencing it. I can feel sadness. I'm, I literally can feel it. I'm experiencing sadness. But we can't really experience love. We don't really feel it. So therefore, we don't even know how to categorize it, right? But the, the downside is this. If you allow yourself to give in to your natural emotional swings and state, then you're essentially giving yourself an excuse, right? So as cognitive beings, as humans that we are, if we, if we treat our homeostatic state biologically in the mammal brain as if we were animals, then that can be problematic. And here's what I mean. So you share this limbic region, this cluster of membranes inside your, of, of your temporal lobe. You share that with mammals. But mammals don't have to deal with the psychological consequences of their instinctive behaviors. And here's what I mean by that. If they, if they experience blind rage and get in a fight, like two lions get in a fight and one of them dies, awesome. Survival of the fittest. They don't have psychological trauma from that. They don't stay up at night and think about the fact that they ended another lion's life. They don't give it a second thought at all. But you do. You and I do. And that matters because now we start talking about criminology. Right? We were talking about serial killers last week. So think about this. When you break down the statistics of murders in the United States, murders, so, I mean, killing someone is not a crime, murdering someone is a crime. When you break down the statistics of murders, it falls into a very, very, very niche category. Overwhelmingly, what you have to do to murder another human being is be male, 
grow some testicles. You have to be under the age of 30. Check. You have to spend a lot of time in bars or live in an inner city environment. Right? Correlations, not causations. But think about this, right? Overwhelmingly, the people who kill other people in America are drunk males or juvenile males. Well, <laughs> and, and, and statistically significant because it's just a giant sample size, right? So if you're much more likely to die or be killed by someone else in some kind of street violence in the inner city or in a bar fight. Well, that's interesting. Why? Well, for several reasons. Why is it that males fight? Well, because testosterone and because of other contributing environmental factors to aggression. And that's a great discussion, right? Is aggression learned? Is it mimics this Bandura situation? And it probably is definitely a contributing factor. Don't get me wrong. Maybe the Women's Christian Temperance Union had something right during Prohibition. Men don't stab each other in their living rooms. Where do they stab each other? In bars. When they're hammered. And you know that because you go to teenage social gatherings. And what do the boys do? They get hammered and they fight each other. Why? Because they're mammals and not people. So your biology is not an excuse to act like a mammal. So, but it's there. So we have to understand circadian rhythms. We have to understand homeostasis. These, these, these are sociological and biological overlap here, right? If you get drunk and you're in a crowded place and you're a male under a certain age, it's much more statistically likely that you will fight someone, which also means it's much more statistically likely that you will die or they will die. Right? Old men don't kill each other in bars. It's because they're infinite wisdom. It's because they're tired and old and they don't go to bars anymore. They're also probably less, you know, testosterone driven. I heard something from a U.S. Marine Corps officer one time that shook me to my core. I'm going to tell you his exact quote. I, want to, I don't want to misquote him. He told me one time in this conversation we were having, we were talking about people who are enlisted soldiers, and he made this statement to me. He said, we need 19-year-olds to fight our nation's wars. And he's right. 30-year-old men don't leave their homes and their wives and go overseas and fight for a cause. Disenfranchised, disgruntled 19-year-olds go overseas and fight. That's why the Vietnam War was considered a poor man's war. That's why Iraq and Afghanistan were considered the young man's war. Middle-aged people don't fight America's wars. They don't have it in them. It's biology. It's development. It's culture, right? So there's a lot of overlapping topics here. You could write a thesis or dissertation about how your chemical rhythms affect you. But it's developmental too, so that's good. Because what happens if you're fighting through a bout of depression at this point in your life? It's no less real but it'll probably get better, right? What happens if you're dealing with anxiety? What happens if you have sleep problems? What happens if you're just life is emotionally in shambles right now? It feels real, it's no less real, but it's probably gonna get better, right? So we have, to, we, have to, we have to give the respect to our biology and know why it's potentially hazardous and dangerous, right? You cannot downplay what it is that you as a young male have the ability to instantly and very quickly do. I don't want to say instant. So, what's the task of being human? You're not a lion. You don't have the luxury of fighting people to the death. Right? You just don't have that luxury. And that's the same thing that happens in relationships too, right? Like, well, I'm not feeling it, or this isn't the right, this doesn't feel right, and we trust this gut instinct that we just think is somehow wisdom and knowledge. It's just not. Right? You have to will your emotions into control, not the other way around. And understand homeostasis, understand your sleep patterns, understand your metabolism, understand when you break down calories, understand when you're more likely to, to have more energy if you want to exercise, right? Understand how your body fluctuates throughout the course of the day. It's emotional, it's chemical, it's hormonal, right? It's metabolic. So you as a student have to understand homeostasis well enough to explain it in an FRQ. Right? If they ask you things about circadian rhythms, if they ask you things about positive and negative emotions, if they ask you things about limbic function, 
Because think about this. Let's get into sleep. What is it that the hypothalamus really does? What is its job? Well, the hypothalamus has sections. It has parts to it. And each of those parts are considered a different nucleus. So the hypothalamus has nuclei. And what happens inside the tissue of the hypothalamus is it's evaluating blood chemistry, right? So you have major arteries and veins throughout your vascular system, right? And they're the major river highways for your vascular system. Well, you have a major artery that runs through the temporal lobe of your brain. It's called the temporal artery. You go to the doctor and they give you that temporal scan. Or more likely than COVID, they shoot that little infrared temporal scanner into your brain. It's because you have a temporal artery running through the middle of your brain which is where your hypothalamus is. Your brain needs blood, needs oxygen, and needs nutrients, and it gets that from your food, right? That's part of that 4% of psychoactive things that gets out of the temporal artery into the brain's synapses and does stuff. So think about it this way. Why are you hungry? Negative emotion. It's a lack of a chemical. You eat food, food's in your stomach, it's not in your brain, right? Those molecules are absorbed into the bloodstream that Glucose blood gets into your brain and the hypothalamus recognizes it. So the hypothalamus, H for hypothalamus, H for homeostasis, its purpose is a constant internal balancing act of homeostasis, right? What is sexual arousal? It's a positive emotion. What is sadness? It's a negative emotion. What is rage? It's a positive emotion, right? And what is the hypothalamus doing? Evaluating blood chemistry. We need less of this, more of this, less of this, more of this. And that takes a lot of energy. So how you fluctuate through your 24-hour day, that's what's referred to as your circadian rhythm. So biology is built for this earth and environment, this ecosystem that we live in. Now think about this. What if you lived in a place where there was no electronic light? What if you lived in a place where you didn't have the cell phone or the alarm clock or, or anything like that? Or even a better, here's a bit more, more realistic example. What happens if you went like primitive camping in the woods? You would feel tired when it got dark because without unnatural light it gets pretty dark out there in the woods and so it's like 7 p.m. and you're like oh I'm kind of tired why because your brain has now recognized it's time to go to sleep what if we didn't have time zones then you would live in a place where you would naturally fall asleep when it was dark because the hypothalamus would trigger the release of melatonin you would wake up when it's daytime right so our chemistry is built environmentally to adapt to this environment that we live in. But our culture doesn't match the environment that we live in. Right? We have electric lights, we have cell phones, we have TVs, we have things that keep us up all the time. Right? Or we have things we manipulate. What if you're like a night nurse or a cop or something and you, and you have to work all night? You actually have to shift your circadian rhythm. You have to train your body to get tired in the morning right? and go to sleep during the day and wake up at night. So you're fighting against your body's natural chemistry until you shift that. Um, what about people that are blind? They have something called non-24 sometimes. Have you guys heard of that? You've seen that commercial where it's like non-24 disorder? So if you're blind, you can't perceive light entering into the eye. So your hypothalamus has no idea when it's daytime or nighttime. Well, that's a problem because now the hypothalamus is just making its best guess and there's a nucleus inside your hypothalamus. You can just abbreviate it to SCN. You'll see it. I think it's vocab. It's known as the supra, above, not super, a suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that's a part of your hypothalamus. Its sole job is to determine when it's time to release melatonin. And how it does it is blue light. Well, if you're blind, the SCN, that nucleus of your hypothalamus, can't perform its job because light is not being perceived. It's not traveling down the optic nerve. It's not going through the thalamus to the occipital lobe. Your brain doesn't know when it's daytime. So it releases melatonin at random times after you've expent energy. So if you're, that's very similar to if you weren't blind but you had narcolepsy. What have sleep attacks? Your brain releases melatonin at inopportune times. So here, I like this definition. Pretty good definition if you ask me for your vocab quiz on Friday. I like the definition of sleep. Remember, we talked about the three levels of consciousness that you can be in. You can be in conscious, unconscious, or you can be in an altered state. So in this definition, a periodic natural loss of consciousness, right? So it almost implies like you're just walking down the street and then you just like fall asleep. But they qualify. 
Not as if you've been knocked unconscious or given anesthesia or you're a bear and you go into hibernation. No, sleep is defined as a level of unconsciousness as unique from being in a coma, as unique from being under anesthesia, as unique from being in hibernation, right? There is an interesting consciousness discussion that I heard in a TED talk. And this is really a rabbit hole is, that we could go down. I want to I put a pin in this for a discussion later because I think this is an interesting take. And I'm still chewing on it. I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't really know all of the details for my stance on this, but I'm going to share with you this perspective. This is, this is a perspective I had never heard or considered before. So I'm, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. This is not my stance on this, but this was thought-provoking for me. This is probably the most biologically sound anti-abortion argument I've ever heard. And again, I'm still chewing on, on the ramifications of this. But remember a few weeks ago when I told you that as I get older, I thought I would like learn the solutions to problems, but really I'm just learning to appreciate how complex these problems are, which is kind of frustrating because you don't get answers. You just learn to appreciate complexity, which is a good thing because you can have a unique perspective, I can have a unique perspective, and we can high five over how complex an issue is and how much gray area there is. In other words, one of us doesn't have to be right. right but that's hard. When I was younger, there's a right and there's a wrong, there's a yes, there's a no, somebody's right and somebody's wrong, and that's just not the reality sometimes. So, enough about that. I was watching this lecture and I, and I heard a neurologist talk about the problem and he didn't start this out as an anti-abortion, and I don't think he was, to be fair to him, I don't think he was being anti-abortion, but he was shooting holes in the definition of life. And he says, from a neurological standpoint, you can't make the argument that the definition of human life is consciousness. Because there are lots of times in your life where you are not conscious at all. Because if you want to make the definition as to what constitutes a human, a conscious being, well, what happens when you go under anesthetic? You're no longer alive. And you say, well, that's semantics. Well, hold on. What happens if you slip into a coma? If you slip into a coma, you're no longer conscious. In fact, you have no concept of time. You have no concept of pain. You have no sensory or perceptual interaction with your environment whatsoever. So to, to define a human being, a human life, as a conscious being is problematic. Right, because now all of a sudden, by legal definition, you are no longer a person when you slip into a coma. And so you can make the argument that, okay, you're fine with that. But that's an interesting discussion. And, and what he did was, and again, to be fair to him, I don't wanna like project what his stance on this was, but he said, if you're going to use that as your definition of where life starts as consciousness, and so fetal tissue can't be a person because it's not consciously aware, well, a sleeping person is not conscious. A person in a coma is not conscious. A person who loses their memories and conscious awareness through Alzheimer's or dementia is no longer a person. So I didn't really ever think about it. That's, that's a complex thing that I'm not smart enough to come up with on my own. I thought that was interesting. So I'll just throw that out into the airwaves and let you chew on that all day on your way home. Right? That kind of made me think a lot. And I enjoy things that make me think. But that's a good point. Right, I don't know necessarily that just to drop dead change your opinion on something, but it's something worth considering. Because consciousness matters, right? If sleep is where we go from being conscious to unconscious, we're not dead. And when you go into a coma or you get knocked unconscious, right, and during your sport or in a car accident, you're not dead. Right? So in other words, the medulla is functioning. You're regulating your own heartbeat. So you are alive, there's brainwave activity. Are you consciously aware? No. That's kind of an interesting discussion. So I think consciousness matters. We have to identify levels of consciousness. And inside of being unconscious, there's like coma unconscious, brainwave activity in the brain stem. So like what is the medical definition of death? Well, it's, it's destruction of the medulla. Because even if we destroy the reticular formation, we can no longer alert you but you're still conscious. Well, you're not conscious, but you're still, you're still breathing. You're still controlling your heart rate because the medulla still works, right? You can destroy the cerebellum and still be alive. You may not be able to stand up and balance yourself anymore. Use your hands very well, but you're still alive. 
So if the definition of death is destruction of the medulla, then the definition of the beginning of life has to be the instigation of the medulla. It's interesting. All right, and again, I don't, I'm, I'm still chewing on that. I'm still processing it. But I thought it was a very interesting neurological take. It wasn't an ethic. I mean, you can, this is different. Ethics are different. Morals are different. Religiosity, that's different. Dogma, that's different. You can make those arguments too, right? And they're very valid in any direction, pro or con, or pro or against, I should say. But from a neurological, psychological standpoint, when we go to sleep, do we die? Do we cease to exist? Well, no. Why? Because a reticular formation can still wake us up. Right? Because here's the reality. The reality is, is that there is an amount of light that will wake you up when you're sleeping. There is an amount of sound. There is a threshold for sound that will wake you up. There is an amount of pain that will wake you up. So I guess the best way to define sleep would be essentially what's happening is this. You don't eliminate the ability to sense things. Let's say it this way. Sleep is really an increase in your absolute threshold. Is it not? It's an increase in your threshold for sound. It's an increase in your threshold for sight. It's an increase in your threshold for pressure, pain. Yep. Yeah, where they cut the reticular formation, they slipped into compass. Well, again, it depends on our human definition of being alive. It, it, it goes back to that TED talk we watched, watched last week. He said, basically, you don't have to be <coughs> consciously aware to suffer, but you do have to be alive, right? So even if we... Let's say that we all agree. I don't know that we all do, but let's say we all agree that cats are not consciously aware like people are. So if cats aren't consciously aware, are they alive then? If the, our definition of life is consciousness, well, the cat is not conscious, so are they alive? Of course they're alive. Why? Because they're breathing. They have homeostasis. So if a cat is not alive, then what does it matter if they die? Isn't there a biological definition for life? Yeah, the ability to control... Life preserving functions in the brainstem. Even if that were the case, what does that look like? Right? So if a cat's in a coma and you stroke its paw and it moves, well is that is that a sensory cortex and motor cortex, you know, muscle twitch? Is it a spinal reflex? And that's the downside of comas, is like we can hook somebody up to an EEG and see brain activity in the in the brain. We can see the brain waves. But to, to what degree is this person actually cognitively alive? In other words, if they're in a vegetative state, are they consciously aware? Is it like a sleep paralysis situation and they're responding to stimuli? So yeah, I mean, it, it's easy for us to sit on paper and come up with a checklist of things that makes something alive. But again, your cat or your dog doesn't check enough boxes to be alive. So are they not alive? Well, see, and that's where, that's, I like that, because maybe, maybe at the essence of the argument, and this is harsh, but I think some people are not even suggesting a taking or, or ending or starting life, it's quality of life. Some people are not morally opposed to ending a life. They're just not, right? So you have people that are pro-capital punishment, you have people that are pro a choice, you have people that are, 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 are pro-execution, you have people that are pro-euthanasia. So it's not the, 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 it's not the taking of life that bothers them. It's the justification of when it's okay to take life. So I'm with you. That's a different conversation. If you want to make the argument we should be able to euthanize patients that are brain dead, we should be able to abort fetuses that, that, that are unwanted, okay, well, that's a different conversation. And I'm, I'm fine with that conversation, but that's not the same conversation as is it ending a life or not ending a life, right? So you're right. They definitely, we have to look at it as what is our consensus definition of being alive, right? So if a cat is not alive because a cat is not consciously aware, then why are we offended that you kill a cat? Tier 3 is consciously aware, but tier 2 is your body is behavior not Well, what if you're paralyzed from the neck down? I mean, are you less alive now? Are you less... Now, physically, from the somatosensory cortex, you're less able to interact with the environment around you. But if you're consciously alert and aware, you could argue that my quality of life is fine. Don't kill me because I can't feel the air. You know what I mean? So you're right. We could, we could. We could divide it up scientifically into tiers of what we call quality of life. But I think at the end of the day, we still circle around the conscious awareness. Because a person who can feel and who can move and can breathe and can regulate their body temperature and has hunger and thirst, and, but they're not consciously aware... 
So they're as alive as anybody, but what is their quality of life? It's hard to say. That's why it's so sticky. It's so like convoluted. That's what's great about philosophy because you can sit there and discuss something for three and a half hours and be no closer to an answer, which is great. I think it's great because it just helps you appreciate the complexity of certain things. Like we can't just be yes, no, right? We can, we can say, okay, all things considered, I'm leaning this way, I'm leaning that way, but it's complex, right? It's a complex issue because I like that. I like what you're saying, right? Do we create tiers of life, quality of life? Are we concerned about life versus non-life, conscious versus non-conscious, quality versus non-quality? And who gets to decide that, right? Does the next akin to get to decide when we pull the plug, right? So let's get back into the sleep side of things. That's more homeostasis, like the regulation of your chemistry, emotions, conscious awareness. But where does sleep come into this, right? Because your ability to recharge your brain has to do with REM cycles, right? The sleep cycles. You have to rest to recharge, right? It's an energy source. So we'll, let's get past circadian rhythms and get deeper into that. There's body regulation, there's metabolic rate, there's, there's times of the day where your energy is, is more available, there's times of the day where you weigh more, right? And, and you know all those things. You learn how to manipulate your circadian rhythms, right? So, you know, if you drink a slim fast shake before you go to sleep, you're gonna maintain that weight better because your metabolism slows down during sleep. So if you're trying to gain protein weight, right, then, then, then you drink a high protein shake or you eat a high protein diet before you go to sleep. But it's problematic to eat your biggest meal of the day before you go to, go to sleep because you, your body's not going to metabolize that at the same rate it is for lunch. You're your most alert in the middle of the day. You have your most access to circulation in the middle of the day. You're more likely to get hot in the middle of the day, even if you stay in a temperature controlled room. When you wake up, your circulation is poor because you've been resting. Your body temperature is low, right? So circadian rhythms are built to kind of like overlap and correlate with the environment in which you are in. And that's, again, electricity and technology, that's, that's developing at a much faster rate than our biology is, right? So our biology is actually competing in some cases and instances with the, with the environment that we're in, right? So let's get into sleep. There are some things about sleep, sleep terminology, vocab and stuff, that you just need to know. Some of them have mnemonic devices. Some of them don't. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at sleep from this standpoint. Sleep as a blanket term is problematic. So you wake up and say, I had six hours of sleep. Who cares? Doesn't matter. It's the type of sleep that you get and the levels of that type of sleep that you get that determines your energy, determines how regenerative it is. And it can affect your mood. It can affect your emotions. So let's look at this. How do we know what we know about sleep? There's some misconceptions. You do not dream throughout the entire course of your night. In fact, many people believe you dream in your deepest state. That's actually the opposite of the truth. So here's the first conception or misconception we need to know. Dreams occur in REM cycles. It's a biological fact. Dreams occur in REM cycles. And you need to know that. So if we divide your, the course of your sleep into two categories, two types of sleep, two qualities, you have REM sleep, rapid eye movement, and you have non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement. Non-REM sleep or in-REM sleep is broken down into stages because your brain wave activity changes. There are three different sort of physical properties of waves that sleep researchers are looking for. So they hook you up to electrodes and you're sleeping in this lab and trying to figure out if you have sleep apnea. And what they're tracking is at what stage of sleep are you in? What level of consciousness are you in? What level do you have REM cycles and dreams? Right. So again, more review. EEG, electroencephalogram. Gram is wave. EKG, echocardiogram. We're not using electrodes. We're using echoes to find that heartbeat. And then we put waves on a monitor, gram, right? Cephala is head. If we put electrodes on the head, we can get waves of activity. There are different types of electrodes that you can use in an EEG, right? You're not gonna use a CT scan for sleep. They put you in this tube and you're sleeping and they're like, yep, there's this brain, there it is, it's in there. They need brain wave activity because brain waves change. So we're gonna look at non-REM sleep, we're gonna look at awake sleep, we're gonna look at deep sleep, right? So the first thing is this, think about this. You need to know what alpha waves are. So think A for alpha, A for awake. 
A for alpha, A for awake, right? Alpha wave sleep is a conscious, relaxed, but very clearly awake state. It's a lot of brain activity. A lot of brain activity. Look at the frequency of these waves, right? These are high intensity, high frequency wavelengths. A lot of brain activity happening here. Right? You don't have to be a neurobiologist to read that. There's a lot of brain activity happening there. That's a functioning mind. So when you're in bed with your eyes closed, a researcher in the next room sees on the EEG relatively slow alpha waves, but your brain is still functioning. You're awake, but you're relaxed, right? So A for alpha, A for awake, right? So the next one, as you slide into sleep, you eventually go through these non-REM stages and you fall into your deepest level of sleep, which is delta sleep, D for delta, D for deep sleep. Many people believe you dream in delta sleep, not true. Not true. So there are three stages of non-REM sleep. Non-REM one, non-REM two, non-REM three. Delta wave sleep, deep sleep, is non-REM three. That's the deepest level of sleep that you can be in in any given night. That's when you sleep walk, when you sleep talk, that's when those night terrors happen. You are the least consciously aware. So if somebody tries to wake you up in delta wave sleep and you're just shaking on the bed, you are as unconscious as an alive person can be in delta sleep, D for delta, D for deep sleep, right? So here's the interesting thing, and Myers is right about this. We as people don't consciously recall the moment when we lose consciousness into a sleep, sleep. But if you look at it on an EEG, you can. You can see the moment when people drift off and they fall asleep. So let's look at it. We talk non-REM and REM. This is what happens. As the night progresses, you go from being awake, non-REM one, non-REM two, non-REM three, and then you hit a REM cycle. So let's look at it. This is what matters in your sleep cycle, right? If you gain nothing else, understand this. Tomorrow. Understand this tomorrow. Leave your hands. It's quality of sleep. It's not amount of sleep. 